Well, good evening to all who have uh, come along here this evening, and we trust that with the Lord's help, uh, your effort in being here when you might have been doing other things on such a, a beautiful evening will be rewarded um, as we turn to the Scriptures. <clears throat> now, I was very surprised when I got here to discover that I wasn't here, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, I hope that, uh, that, that tonight we will have the Lord's help as we look at Nehemiah chapter 1 together. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 1. I have in mind, if uh, time allows, to move all the way through this chapter if we can. We'll not be able to look at all the details of it, but we'll read all of chapter 1 together. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Kislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him, and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though they were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name, and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. That is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> now, before we look at the content of the chapter itself, I'd like to take a little step back and to see the book of Nehemiah in the context of the Old Testament as we have it. Because as we look at the Old Testament, it helps us uh, to realize that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for us. And it'll help us, if we understand its context in the, in the wider scheme, to be able to make application to us. And I hope that that will help us as we look at the, at the passage tonight. Now, Nehemiah is one of three of the last of the historical books of the Old Testament. We have a block of 17 books. And the last three of those are post-exilic prophecy books, uh, post-exilic history books. Now, closely corresponding with the last three of those 17 history books are the last three of the 17 prophecy books. And the last three of those prophecy books are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And chronologically, as far as timing is concerned, you can read these books almost alongside each other. The ministry of Haggai and Zechariah was seen very much in the day of Zerubbabel and Ezra. But again, just to take a little step back and to appreciate the history of the children of Israel and God's purpose for them will help us to make application, help me to application, make application to my life today. 
You see, God had chosen a nation. He had chosen the people Israel to be his representatives on earth, that they might be, his design for them was, that they should be a nation of priests and that they might represent him before the other nations around, that they might live to the glory and the honor of his name and through the blessing that God would bring on them as they followed a pattern and a pathway of obedience to God, that other nations too would seek the God of Israel, that they too might come to trust him and to love him and to follow his ways also. But you see, as we follow the pathway of the children of Israel, though they had been redeemed out of the land of Egypt from slavery and bondage, and though they had been brought into the promised land for their enjoyment and for their blessing, Perhaps the best of their days, maybe this is open for discussion, but perhaps the best of their days may have been seen under the latter part of of David's reign and under the earlier part of Solomon's reign. But afterward we find that division and departure was something that marked the children of Israel as they moved away from the pathway that God had for them and they turned aside from their trust in the one true and living God and they turned aside to the idols the false gods of the nations around them. And they adopted the practices and the sinful ways of the world that they were meant to be be living as a testimony to. You see what is happening is God's name is no longer honored amongst them. They are bringing dishonor upon God's name. And so God speaks to them time and time again by the prophets, warning them that correction must follow if it is that they continue in that pathway of disobedience and departure and division from him. But ultimately, it was necessary for them to be taken away into captivity. But I want to see tonight that where Nehemiah introduces his book, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, that where Hakaliah means darkness of Jehovah and Nehemiah means comfort of Jehovah, What we have in the book of Nehemiah is that which follows on from the captivity and the correction that's being administered because God's hand of discipline is with a view to correction. And when it is that that correction has been administered and responded to positively, then that's a comfort to the people of God. I suppose it would be appropriate, wouldn't it, for me just to put that into the context of our situation this evening because God has called us to be a people for the honour of his name, to be a testimony for him to the nations around us and to the world around us, that they too may see the way in which God has blessed us and they too may seek the God whom we love, the God who has redeemed us and brought us into a land of spiritual blessing and has an eternal future ahead of us that is to be shared with the Lord Jesus himself. And if it is, that we at times feel that hand of correction of God that comes upon us, then we find that that is in keeping with the word of God. Because the writer of the Hebrews takes up a passage from Proverbs and tells us that, that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And because we are not the finished article, it is necessary for God to administer discipline to us. And I need to be humble. We need to be humble enough to recognize when God is moving in a, in, in a manner of discipline toward me, so that as I respond positively to that and accept God's discipline, then afterward, says the writer to the Hebrews, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And so tonight I hope that this will come across as a word of comfort, comfort of Jehovah against that background of God's hand of discipline. So much then for the wider context. When we come to the nearer context, we find that these three books that I've mentioned in the the Old Testament, these three post-exilic prophets, post-exilic history books, I should say, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, they're recording the events that followed the captivity. Now, there were three returns from captivity. The first, I don't want to labor these, but just, just to put them into their place. The first was Zerubbabel, and his concern was for the rebuilding of the temple. The second return was led by Ezra, and his burden was the reformation of the people. And when we come to Nehemiah, we find that his burden, his great concern, was for the rebuilding, the restoration of the city walls. Now, 
the, chapter, the whole book has a lot to do with the rebuilding of the city walls, especially chapter 3. But I think that there's a significance to the, the walls as well. You see, the, the walls of the city of Jerusalem, they constituted a, a physical boundary, a demarcation line, if you like, around the centre of testimony. And that was something that was necessary because God intended that his people should be marked by separation. But it wasn't just a wall that was constructed. It wasn't a wall that needed to be rebuilt. There were gates that there were openings in that wall because God doesn't intend his people to be separate in a way that leaves them isolated. But you see, there should be access points. And again, Nehemiah chapter 3 would bring those access points before us. Those that would be instructive spiritually to us as well. God intends that his people should have interaction with the world around whilst maintaining a manner of separation too. But of course, it's really important, isn't it? That within each of those gateways that there will be doors to regulate what comes in and what goes out. You know, I was working in a house one day and uh, I was right out the back doing some work in the kitchen. And, and I, was, I, I turned around surprised to see that a fellow had walked in, was standing in the kitchen with me and he wanted to sell me uh, something or another. And, and I was so taken aback and I responded very politely to him. But, you know, I'd left the front door open. And I, I, can, I can almost guarantee that if the, if the front door remains shut, that man would have known that he wasn't welcome just to wander his way in. But he had taken the liberty. And sometimes we need to operate the doors. And we need to see that we are regulating what comes in and what goes out. You know, it's a good job that I wasn't reading later on in the book of Nehemiah. Because when he found people hanging around in a place that he didn't want them to, he warned them that he was going to lay hands on them. Well, I wasn't ready to do that with the chap who was in the kitchen. But still, the point stands that we do need to we do need to maintain that regulation within our lives. And that applies on a number of different levels. It's necessary personally. You know, this, the, the Word of God tells us in Proverbs, he that hath no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. And we need the Word of God to set out before us those things that we will do and those things that we will not do. Now, the Word of God doesn't always state explicitly what we should do in every circumstance of life. We're faced with things every day that are, are not mentioned by name in the Scriptures. But you see, I, I find that when, when the boundary of the, the nation of Israel was being plotted, there were certain points that you were to trace the boundary from and to. And those, those distinctive landmarks enabled people to be able to draw a line from one point to the next. And I take it that we can do that also with the Word of God. There are scriptural principles that we can take on board. And as we, we bring one spiritual thing and put it alongside another, that will help us. I'm not saying I find it easy. I'm not saying that we'll all find it easy to be able to see exactly where that line should be. But those things should, should help us as we compare spiritual things with spiritual to be able to determine those things that we are prepared to be involved in and those things that we are not prepared to be involved in. It's important too that we apply this principle of separation domestically. And again, we have a little example in the scriptures in 2 John, where the lady to whom John is writing is warned that those people who are coming and bringing a false doctrine, they should not be welcomed in. And we need to guard our homes too against certain things that both the world would set out before us and two, those false doctrines that would threaten our families. But it's also true as far as the household of God is concerned. There are those things that belong. There are those things that do not belong. And so it's clear that we need to maintain that kind of regulation as far as our own individual lives are concerned, as far as our homes are concerned, and as far as the assembly of God is concerned also. So there we have then a little application of the walls of the centre of testimony. Now I'd like to look at the first few verses of Nehemiah chapter 1 and to see uh, Nehemiah's priority. He was a man of priority. The circumstances are described to us in the opening verse. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. He says, it came to pass in the month Kislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace. 
Now, it helps us just to introduce the very last expression of the chapter to see that Nehemiah was a man who was part of that group of captives who were there in the land of Babylon. And Nehemiah finds himself in Shushan the palace with a great responsibility, that of being cupbearer to the king. If you like, he was the king's butler and responsible for bringing him his cup of wine in order that he might drink. And so Nehemiah had a very high and a very responsible job and I suppose that there were associated comforts that must have come with that role also. There he is in Shushan the palace. I like the fact though that Nehemiah's comforts, whatever they may have been, didn't blind him to the needs of others around and especially to the needs of the people of God, perhaps some thousand miles or so as, as the crow flies away uh, over in Jerusalem. And I can see there a little application for myself and for all of us here this evening. Whatever comforts we may be able to enjoy in the world that God has blessed us with. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're all living in the lap of luxury. I know that energy prices are going up. I know that mortgage interest rates are rising. I know that, that wages are not catching up with all the rest of them. I know that food prices are going through the roof. I'm not suggesting that we're living in the lap of luxury. But the scriptures do instruct us and they guide us to have consideration for our fellow believers and those that are far off also. You see, there will be times when there are certain believers who are better off at one particular time and others who are struggling. And we find that the Apostle Paul, he gave instruction concerning this to the churches when it was that there was a dearth in Jerusalem. And he wanted to gather up a gift so that he could take it and carry it over so that it might alleviate the burden of those who were experiencing a time of difficulty. And so Nehemiah, he was aware of other things that were going on around. He also indicates to us a calendar note. He says it came to pass in the month Kislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace. Now, where Nehemiah was, they operated under the Persian calendar. They had their own way of tracking time. And I like the fact that Nehemiah, he was following God's calendar. And he chooses to name the month according to the Jewish way of doing things. And so Nehemiah, whilst he was busy and occupied in his secular work, shall we say, he remembered the things of the Lord. And he remembered God's calendar. And it seems to me that this really was his priority. The things of God and the people of God. And as we're going to find out, the place where God had set his name. These things were all a real burden and a concern to this man, Nehemiah. A godly man. And so we're seeing already that Nehemiah was a man who, whilst he was in a responsible role, whilst he may have been enjoying certain comforts, Nehemiah wasn't conformed to the world around him. No, it seems to me that Nehemiah, he had demonstrated the ability to be able to exercise separation in his own personal life. And such a man, we'll find, was soon going to be fitted and suitable to be leading the rebuilding task that would set in place that demarcation line of separation for the center of testimony. And that, of course, is something also that is fitting for those who are leaders of God's people today. We find that, don't we, in the book of 1 Timothy, that those who take the role of leadership, and also in Titus, chapter 1, they are those who have first demonstrated the ability to be able to regulate their own lives personally, to be able to regulate their lives domestically and in the world in which they live. So Nehemiah here, he was a fit man to take on the responsibility. Mind you, whilst he was watching God's calendar, he was aware of what was going on around him. And that's why he says it was in the 20th year. I suppose this is a reference to the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. Now, as we've mentioned the calendar, might I just raise that as a challenge to myself and to all of us this evening? What about the things of God? What about the things of God? What about God's calendar today? Sure, we don't have the Feast of Jehovah uh, that we have to keep. We don't have to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. But when I turn to Acts chapter 2, I find that there were certain things that were a priority for the people of God. I find that those who gladly received the word, they were baptised 
and they were added to the company of believers. And that company continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. I wonder, would that mark my life? Continuing steadfastly in those things that would be appropriate to describe perhaps as God's calendar today. What about when the assembly meet together for prayer? What about when there's Bible teaching? What about when it is that the assembly are gathered together in fellowship? And what about the breaking of bread that the practice of the early church was to meet on the first day of the week? Well, there we have the calendar of God. You know, very often the, the calendar can, can fill up and the world will fill our calendar for us, won't it? Work commitments, other responsibilities or other attractions and distractions, they can so easily fill up the week. Nehemiah, it seems to me, wanted to put God's things first. And I think it would be a good practice for me also, if you like, if not literally, but in mind already at the start of a new year, to be just marking out those points when the local company of God's people are gathering together and to see that the things of God are coming first. We find then in, in verse 2 that, that Nehemiah comes across Hanani, one of his brethren. Now, I think that it may well be that Hanani was literally his brother in the flesh. He's mentioned later on in the book, and uh, the, the manner in which he, he speaks about him may indicate that he was, in fact, his brother in the flesh. Now, I, I like the fact that he describes Hanani as being one of his brethren. Here's Nehemiah in a high position in the palace, and one of these folks from Jerusalem have arrived, one of the poor that have been left behind. And when he arrives, Nehemiah says, there's my brother. This reminds me of another man who also looked and saw his brethren. And as Moses, who had been raised in the palace, also looked out, and he saw those who were being afflicted, he said, they're my brethren. And it wasn't long, was it, before Nehemiah would choose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He left the palace of his glory in order to identify with the people in need. And isn't that a lovely devotional picture to us of the Lord Jesus? One who left the palace of his glory and chose rather to suffer affliction here on earth for our benefit and for the honour and for the glory of God's name too. Was Nehemiah's position a sinful one? Should he have been cupbearer at this particular point? Or, or like Esther, had he been raised to this position so that it might be said also of him, who knoweth whether thou hast been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this? Because we find that Nehemiah was going to be instrumental in petitioning the king to see that the city walls were going to be rebuilt together with the gates and the door was put back in place also. I take it that it wasn't a sinful position. However, when the Lord laid his hand upon him, there was that burden that just couldn't be let go. And I think that this really was the burden that Nehemiah had when we come to chapter 2. When he feared before the king, it was not that he might lose his head, although that might have been the case to have been sad in the king's presence. His burden was for the furtherance of God's work. That's why he feared. You know, I remember speaking to a, a couple who were, who were missionaries and, uh, and chatting to them. I asked them about their experience and how they ended up being where they were in their service for the Lord. And they said to me, well, it came to a point where God seemed to have laid his hand upon us to the degree that it's almost as if it would have been sinful not to go. So again, I don't think that Nehemiah's position was sinful per se. But when the burden that the Lord had laid upon him was there, Nehemiah could hardly do anything else but bring this issue before the Lord. And that is just what he did. You know, the report that came back to him was that the remnant that were left there in the captivity in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. The report was that there are, are not many left, a remnant, just a few. And really, 
the, the, the walls are a laughing stock. When we come into the next chapter, we find that Nehemiah, he could have just walked in and out at night time. What kind of protection, what kind of defense was that be? A laughing stock as far as people around were concerned. The city walls were in reproach. The people were in reproach because of the, because of the state of the city. And so this was a real burden to Nehemiah. And he responded, I believe, in a very appropriate manner. Because we find that it's described before us in verse 4. When I heard these words, I sat down. You know, we, we sometimes say to somebody, don't we, when they've got to prepare for a shock, now, you should just sit down for a moment. Because this is going to shake you. And Nehemiah was shaken for sure when he had heard the situation of the people in Jerusalem. I sat down and I wept. The spontaneous language of sorrow. He says, I mourned certain days and fasted. And through this fasting, he was identifying himself with the people of God in their affliction. Whatever comforts Nehemiah had, he was feeling their affliction, even though he was so far away from them. And so Nehemiah, he identified with them as he fasted. And he prayed before the God of heaven. Here we have his supplication. Now I wonder how we respond when difficulty comes along. You know, we could almost take some of the language that's, that's used here. Is it not a, a common sort of expression? Well, you know, there are not many left. And the things that are, well, they're just, they're just keeping going. What is the appropriate response to that? Well, a concern for the people of God and for the place where he has placed his name, might I suggest initially, would be that of prayer. You know, when distressing situations come our way, the, the immediate knee-jerk reaction is not always the best way of responding. And we find that later on, Nehemiah, you know, he came across certain circumstances that made him angry. And he says, I consulted with myself. And at times, we need to do that. We need just to, to allow a few moments to think about what's happened and to, to pray before God so that the right recourse might be taken as a result. Well, Nehemiah prays. And after we've brought before our attention this evening Nehemiah's priorities and, and challenged ourselves as to what our priorities are, then we can look at Nehemiah's prayer as a wonderful pattern. It's a very fine prayer. We notice in verse 5 and verse 6 that his prayer, it was marked by reverence. We notice in verse 7 that, that Nehemiah's prayer, it was marked by repentance. We notice in verse 8 and 9 that Nehemiah's prayer, it was marked by remembrance. We find then that he's going to ask the Lord to restore the people back to the city. The people, he says in verse 10, thy servants, thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. And we find then that Nehemiah is going to close with a specific request. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. He has in mind an audience with the king. So then let's look at this prayer, shall we, and make application as we do so. Nehemiah's prayer then, it was marked by reverence. He says, I beseech thee. This is the language of somebody who realizes that he's approaching into the presence of somebody who is far greater than himself. Now, you and I do have the privilege of having a close relationship with God and to be able to address him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not for us to require of God this or that or the other, but to offer request. And I would suggest that one function of prayer is that our will might be conformed to his will. And as we pray in the Holy Spirit, we're learning the will of God as we're presenting our requests before him. Nehemiah addresses the Lord as Jehovah. That's really what we have. And I said, I, be I beseech thee, O Lord. Nehemiah is presenting his request before the self-existent and self-dependent God, somebody who doesn't need his people. And yet it's pleased him, according to his grace, to bring us in according to his purpose and to use us for his glory. The name Jehovah also it conveys to us the unchanging character of God. What a contrast to the people of God who were changeable who, and who had been unfaithful. 
But Nehemiah is he's going to draw on the reliability and the faithfulness of God as he makes his request before him. Because it's not going to be on the, on the merits of the people themselves, but on the faithfulness and on the desire and the purpose of God that he's going to make this request. He says, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven. <laughs> Here he recognizes that he's approaching before one who is far higher than earth. Was it Solomon who said, when the temple had been constructed, that, uh, uh, that the God didn't, didn't need a house to dwell in? He said, even the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. And Nehemiah here, he's bowing, if you like, at the footstool of Jehovah. And he's presenting his request, recognizing the greatness of God, recognizing his power. He describes him as the great and terrible God. Now, where we find the word terrible here, the idea is not of, of badness or, or evil, but the idea is, is that of, uh, of awe. Great describes that the magnitude of God's power and terrible, it describes the awe that inspires on my part when I see his greatness. You know, on a very simple level, we can see it when, when there's a wonderful vista that's set out before us, a wonderful view in creation. And we see the greatness of what God has done. And we stand back and say, wow. We see the greatness of God. And it inspires awe on our part. Nehemiah appreciates the greatness and the power of God that keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. He realizes here that obedience and reverence is the key to drawing on God's blessing. That is what God desires from us. Obedience to his word. Reverence, appreciation of his greatness. I've mentioned this before in connection with another passage. These two things are linked. As we revere God and as we obey his commandments, whether or not we understand the purpose of them, of course, there are times that the Apostle Paul wanted believers to not be ignorant about the way in which they were doing things. But as God desires from us reverence and obedience as he sees it, it's a recipe for blessing. And Nehemiah appreciated this. He says he keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Nehemiah had a tremendous work ahead of him here, a monumental task, the rebuilding of the city walls in a place where really there was no safety afforded, no protection, a place that was miles away that likely he'd never been to. To my knowledge, Nehemiah had no experience of any kind of building work. A tremendous task. You say, well, Nehemiah, how are you going to do it? He says, I recognize the greatness of God. I see his power. And as I appreciate his mercy and his interest, his pity for little me, he says, I realize that this great work is something that can be wrought of God. You know, that's what the enemies of God said later on. The enemies of God's people, they could see that this work was wrought of God. Now, it could be that you and I are facing different challenges. It may not be that we've got the responsibility of building city walls. I'm glad I haven't got any responsibilities like that. But you might say our task is even greater when it comes to spiritual things. And in the face of real adversity, especially in, in the nation in which we live in now. But we have a great God. We have a God who understands our own weaknesses. We have a God who is able to meet our needs and to provide the resources necessary to see that there may be a testimony for God that will be for the honor of his name and will be a wonderful draw to the people around that others too may come to the Savior. So Nehemiah's prayer then it was marked by reverence, it was marked by repentance. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night. This I take it was through that period whilst he was mourning and fasting and he was constantly seeking an audience with God. This period, if you like, of prayer, by the way, was something in the region of about three months. Before we come to that, what has sometimes been called an arrow prayer in chapter two, much has been made, made and rightly so, about the fact that we can just offer that little arrow prayer to God, and he hears. But uh, it's worthwhile noting too, 
that it was preceded by three months saturated in prayer. And I think that this prayer that we have in verses 5 through to the end really constitutes the culmination of Nehemiah's prayer. Whether or not his prayer always took this form, I don't know. Maybe this was a prayer that developed as time went on. I wonder if you find that in your experience, that you're praying about something. And as we've said, one purpose of prayer is, is that our will might be conformed to God's will. And at times we might adjust the way in which we present our prayers. And perhaps through our reading of Scripture and through our adjusting of the way in which we present our requests, it may be that we're getting closer to the mind of God. Do we not find that in the Psalms? Sometimes the psalm writer opens all downcast and burdened, expressing just how terrible everything is. And by the time they come to the end, you can see they've had the opportunity to reflect and to realize the greatness of God and to trust again in his salvation and to follow his ways and say, yes, I will trust in thee. So Nehemiah, he expresses his, repair de- his prayer day and night, and his prayer was for the children of Israel, thy servants, and here he says he confesses the sins of the children of Israel, which he says we have sinned against thee. This is the language, is it not, uh, that the David used against thee, the only have I sinned. Yes, sins may be against others, but primarily sins are against God. He identifies himself with the people, in this kind of priestly way, he says, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. He goes on to name certain ways in which they have sinned against God. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Now, those three terms might seem to blur a little bit at times. But when we see them mentioned together, they have a significance in that they they differ. Commandments, I would suggest, are those precepts that are set out in Scripture where there is a very clear yes or no answer to something, such as we find in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Precepts. Nehemiah says we have not kept the precepts. We have not kept the commandments. He refers also to statutes, which often would refer to certain practices, certain tasks or duties that were the children of Israel were responsible for in association with the ceremonial law. Nehemiah says there are practices that we have not kept that we ought to have done. He then also refers to the judgments. And again, we have help in Scripture as to what this kind of term might mean. Because as we follow on from from Exodus chapter 20, where we have the precepts, the commandments set before us, we come into chapter 21, and the head of the chapter says, now these are the judgments. Now these are not penal sentences, not that kind of judgment, but it is a manner of discerning something, such as we were talking about earlier on. We might call them principles. Certain principles of Scripture that lead you to be able to make application in certain ways of life. Now, Nehemiah says we have not kept the precepts, the practices, and the principles that we were expected to. Now, we haven't got time to pause and to apply that, but let us just take that on board, shall we? That there are precepts in the New Testament that come to the people of God that he expects of us. Very clear, distinct things that we're either keeping or we're not keeping. Didn't the Lord Jesus say, this is my commandment, that ye love one another. That is a choice, to love one another. A precept. We also have practices. There were practices that were maintained by the early church. Traditions that the Apostle Paul had taught the churches to maintain. What about the practices today? Am I keeping them? Are we keeping them as the people of God as a whole? What about the principles that God would expect of the people of God today? Are they being maintained? Well, says Nehemiah, whether or not he himself was personally culpable for it, he identifies himself with the people of God. And I suppose that there must have been a measure of shame that was induced in naming certain of these things. But doesn't that help in the process of repentance? When it is that we're prepared to 
name and to acknowledge when there are times that we have sinned against God. And as we acknowledge those things in his presence, and say, now I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have spoken to somebody in such a way. I should have been honest instead of disobedient. It will help us to move on and to repent of those things. Now, I, I ought to say, I ought to say that God is faithful and just. And when we bring these things before him, the people of God need not fear eternal judgment because Christ has paid the debt in full. So I don't want to leave anybody with the impression tonight that the things that God might bring to our attention by way of discipline will lead to eternal destruction. Far from it. Because the scriptures do say very, very plainly, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so we find that the, 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 the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, it cleanses from every sin, past, present, and future. Nehemiah then, he, he, and he brings in prayer remembrance. He, he remembers things that God has said, and he remembers them back to God. Now, firstly, he's remembering that God had treated his people just as he'd said he would. He says, now, I, I remember, and I want you to remember, O God, that, that the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Now, these things are found in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The first point I want to make here is that Nehemiah knew the scriptures and he was reading the scriptures, perhaps even during this period of prayer and as these circumstances were being described, perhaps Nehemiah was reading from the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. He says, now, this is our circumstances. The Lord is speaking to us and he's telling us, this is what I've done to you. But I'm thankful that Nehemiah kept on reading because he went on reading and he, he said, now, Lord, I've also found that you said you would scatter us abroad amongst the nations and you have, faithful to your word, but you've also said, if you turn back to me, then I'll restore you again. So, so it's, it's a simple formula, isn't it? Now, what they've got to do, as we've said earlier, this idea of responding to the hand of discipline of God. Nehemiah says, now we're going to confess our sins. Lord, won't you bring us back? I, I would say tonight that it's good for me to keep reading God's word and for all of us to keep reading God's word. And though we're reading the same passages, perhaps time and time again, when you're reading the scriptures, you'll find that you'll be in different circumstances now than you were this time last year when you were going through your Genesis to Revelation in a year. And so there's a different lesson to come to you. And there's a different way in which God wants to direct you. And sometimes there's even the plot in the way out ahead of you, just as he was to Nehemiah. Well, the psalmist said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And, you know, Daniel, he, he too was able to take this on board, wasn't he? Because when he was concerned with the people of God, and he was concerned, no doubt, too, for the place where God had set his name, he was reading. And as Daniel was reading, he came through Jeremiah. He read, guess what? He read about a captivity. And that captivity was going to last 70 years. And Daniel says, Lord, this is our circumstances. And now we know how to respond. And so it will be as we're reading through the scriptures. And as we read about different characters in the Bible and think about the experiences through which they pass, we at times will be able to say, now those are very comparable to the circumstances through which I am passing. This situation is just what I'm experiencing at the moment. And perhaps through those things, God will guide us in the way that we might respond. Well, says Nehemiah, he says, Lord, you've said that you would, you would scatter us. But you've also said you would gather us. And so he's going to make request, like Elijah. You know, Elijah prayed, didn't he, that, that God would maintain his word, that he would uphold his word by withholding the rain. And then he asked that God would send the rain. And he was able to do so. How, how was he able to pray so boldly? Because the Lord had already said in his word what he was going to do. And there are certain things that 
when we make our requests in prayer, we can do so boldly. Yes, we still do so with reverence and we make requests, but we can do so boldly because the Lord tells us explicitly at times things that he wants to do or things that he will do. Don't we have that in James chapter 1? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. We have a God who is ready to give wisdom, if it is that we sense that we need it. When we ask in faith, the scripture tells us that God will give it. So there are certain prayers that we can bring before God. And of course, it comes back again, doesn't it, to reading the scriptures. Because as we read the scriptures, we're learning God's ways. We're learning what God would want. And we can ask him to fulfill on earth what is already planned in heaven. So the Nehemiah, he, in his prayer, he remembers before God. You know, I, I think that that is a very appropriate thing at times also in worship. You know, perhaps there are times that we hardly know how to express ourselves before God as we think about the loveliness of his son and what he's done for us. But, you know, God tells us what he thinks about his son. And that helps us to share his appreciation. So I, I don't think that we need to be afraid or ashamed in, in prayer to be returning back to God, the things that we have enjoyed, that he has shown to us for our enjoyment and to thank him for it. <coughs> now, Nehemiah presents his request in verse 10. These are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. Now, just in case the message didn't get home in the way in which I read that verse, it's nothing about self. It's nothing about merit. This request to God is a prayer for his grace and a prayer for his mercy. Why? Because God had redeemed him. They belonged to him by redemption, and he'd purchased their release by his strong hand. And he would not, and by the way, he never will abandon Israel, because that is the kind of God that we have. He is faithful to his word and faithful to his people. Now, as we follow the steps to restoration before God, we too can use the same kind of language. Has not God redeemed us? Not by our merit? And if it is a time we have found that our feet have slipped on the pathway that God has set out before us, can we not also bring our requests before God on the merit of the precious blood of Christ? Not by ourselves, but all according to his mercy. And so, the scripture tells us, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are, which are God's. We're his by creative right but we're his by redemptive right also. Verse 11, then Nehemiah presents his, uh, the, the culmination, really, of his request. It seems to me that he is in anticipation of a day that he may be able to present a certain request before God. I think that he really had a specific day in mind, which is why at the end of the verse he says, I pray thee, thy, uh, prosper, I pray thee, thy servant, this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He is conscious that there is a private opportunity coming up, and it was an opportunity that he would have to be able to present a specific request, which, by the way, we also have scripture for. This was a tremendous moment in Israel's history and in God's calendar. Because when you read in Daniel chapter 9, you discover that the request that Nehemiah was going to present before King Artaxerxes was going to when it was answered positively, it was going to set in movement a chain of events that was going to lead to the entrance of the Lord Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. It was named, as far as the number of years were concerned, how long it would be from the rebuilding of the city walls to the entrance of Messiah into Jerusalem. That's tremendous. And Nehemiah perhaps felt the great burden, if you like, that was on his heart in relation to this particular moment. And this is why Nehemiah is presenting his request. He recognizes here, by the way, that God is sovereign and that he is able to bring this about. And when he says, O Lord, I beseech thee, he's not actually using now the word Jehovah, 
but he's using the term Adonai, which is a reference to the sovereign Lord. And whilst Nehemiah pays due deference to the king, and he would address him in an appropriate manner, as is fitting for us, by the way, to honour the authorities of our day, Nehemiah recognised that as far as God was concerned, he was just a man. Which is why he says, uh, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant um, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So when Nehemiah is going before the king, he says, as far as you're concerned, O God, he's just a man. You see, God is able to direct the heart of the king as the rivers of water and direct it whithersoever he will. And God was going to use, from what I can see, as much as a godless man as ever there might have been, to fulfill, fulfill his purpose, just as he had, as far as Nebuchadnezzar was concerned, bringing the children of Israel into captivity. You know, God can do that today. God can turn back a tide. When it is his purpose to do so, God can change those in leadership and the heart of those in power to alter things when it is fitting for him to do so. And ours is to make our request before God and make them in accordance with his will, but also to be wise as to how to respond if the authorities do not change. And so we find that Nehemiah, he presents his request then and asks that he might have mercy in the sight of the king. And, you know, as Nehemiah prays, he's going to find, like Jacob of old, that when he had power with God, he was going to have power with men. That's what Jacob found, wasn't it, as Israel, a prince with God, one who depended on God, one who desired and sought all the strength that he could from God and clung on to him, would not let him go. It is through that that he would have power with men. I want to suggest that that is the way in which I need to seek God. That is the way in which I need to depend on God, to let all strength of self go and to cling on to God only. And in doing so, that I might find too, that having power with God, that he will open up doors, that we might have power also with men. Perhaps in closing, we could just leave a, a positive little thought for us. <clears throat> Nehemiah, he was presenting a request, going to present a request before the king that was going to trigger off a chain of events that was going to lead to the entrance of Messiah. So what about our experience, perhaps, as we have some soul in our mind? Maybe not on the same grand scale as Nehemiah, but perhaps as we would have some soul on our hearts, we might present our burdens before the Lord. And in doing so, he might open up an opportunity that would give us the chance to speak a little word to somebody who is as yet outside of Christ that might lead or trigger off a chain of events that would lead to the entrance of Messiah into their lives. God can do it. The great God, the God of, of heaven, the God of all power, the covenant-keeping God, the God of, of all mercy and pity, the God whose pity reached from highest heaven as his Son came down to earth, so that we from, from the dust might be lifted up to heaven. He can still do that today. And so we have, I trust, a word of encouragement. As we reflect on the, the book of Nehemiah, we see that, that it's the restoration that's being brought after God's hand of discipline. We need to recognize that the discipline will come in our lives. If, if there is no discipline, we're not God's because he disciplines his children. But it is always in love. It's with a view to restoration. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And our attitude ought to be that of responding positively to that correction so that afterward it would yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I suppose that just as we have seen it on the bigger picture and on the smaller picture, that my responsibility first is to examine my own life before I stretch it out to see the wider application as well. But it could be applied in many different spheres. But just now this evening, I think that it starts at home. Comfort of Jehovah, and trust that the Lord will bless his word to us this evening. Let's close.